Good morning, everyone. Good to see you on this cold, wintry day. Now it's, it is quite a shock to the system when you walked outside this morning. Uh, we will be in the book of John. Go ahead and turn to, to the book of John. We're going to be in chapter 3 today. And just to kind of catch you up where we were left off, uh, we are in John chapter 3. Of course, lots has to do with Nicodemus there and his, his uh, questions and his, he and Jesus' interaction on entering into the kingdom of God and how can a person enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus, of course, says it is not what man can do, but it's what God can do to a man. And it is the Holy Spirit moving uh, upon that person to birth them again, to regenerate that person. And if today you have been born again, it is a supernatural work of God upon you. It is a supernatural, you might call it miraculous, work of God who has brought you to see the beauty of Christ and the horribleness of your sin, where you hate your sin and you love God now. You did not arrive at that on your own. That is a work of God, and we praise God for that. So, God just explains that to Nicodemus. And then last week we looked at verse uh, 14 through 21, which carries on that same conversation there, uh, where Jesus compares himself to the bronze serpent, you might say, there in uh, Numbers 21. And so we looked at that situation, we looked at that scene, we looked at that story uh, where the Israelites are being bitten by poisonous snakes, and God tells Moses to lift up a bronze serpent on a pole, and all who look at the serpent will be healed. They will live. And there in verse 15, or 14 and 15 of John chapter 3, Jesus compares himself to that. Uh, just look briefly over there at 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And of course, he moves right into 316, which is much better known in our world than verse 14 and 15. But you've got to see how they go together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we looked at several comparisons there, that, uh, that the, the serpent, the snake, the lifting it up, people looking at him to be healed, that was a type, a shadow. Uh, Jesus is the antitype or the substance, the ultimate fulfillment of that. Uh, we looked at several, just kind of mentioning that, like in the Old Testament, the lamb, of course, is a, is a type, is a shadow, and Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of that, as John the Baptist announces him. He is the substance of it. Uh, so in, is this situation... So we looked at several comparisons. Uh, number one, that the recipients of grace have become greater in number with Jesus. Now instead of the Israelites who have been bitten by a snake looking to the bronze serpent to live, now it's the world. Uh, God has given this, this the supreme object of grace that now it's all who look at him, uh, everyone who looks at him, not just the Israelites. Number two, we looked at the fact that the object of salvation has become greater Instead of just a bronze serpent, this is the creator of the world itself that has come to earth. This is God in the flesh now, the Son of God that has come, that all who look at him will have eternal life. And number three, we look at the salvation is much greater. There they looked to a snake and they lived. But how long did they live? They all still died, right? Uh, not so with Jesus Christ. Those who believe in him and look to the Son who has been lifted up, and crucified on our behalf, died and then resurrected and ascended into heaven, those that look to him not only live but have eternal life now. The salvation is much greater. And also you could add to this the result, number four, of not believing is of course worse. Those who rejected to uh, look at God's Object of grace there with Moses lifting up the, the bronze serpent on the, on the pole, um, uh, they died. Those who do not look to the Son uh, in belief, they receive condemnation, as this chapter goes on to explain. They stay in their sins. They continue to receive the wrath of God for all of eternity because they did not look to the Son. So we covered a lot of that information in the last two weeks. And also we noted... Uh, just kind of putting this chapter 3 together before we move on, that even though, like, Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to uh, the wind. We noted that it, the wind is uncontrollable. Uh, we cannot control the wind. We use that example of the tornado that came through Arkansas lately. Like, if you stand in front of it and say, can you move to the left? The tornado is not going to say, sure, I'll oblige, right? 
You can't control that. Why? Because it's out of your control. And uh, Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to that. You can't tell the wind what to do. You cannot tell the sovereign God what to do. You cannot command God. But when the Holy Spirit does birth a person again, there are effects. And that's what we see with the wind. The wind is blowing. How do you know the wind is blowing? Because you see things moving. And how do you know a person has been born again? Because there are effects. And if you have right belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you see the exclusivity of him, that you must look to him and him alone for your salvation. You hate your sin. You see your sin. This is brought about supernaturally by being born again by the Holy Spirit. All right, so with that said, let's move to our text today. It is going to be John 3, 22 through 36. It is quite a bit to take on, I'll be honest. Uh, but I think we can handle it. Uh, so we're going to go for it. Verse 22 through 36. Let's look there. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a, dis and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word uh, that you've given us to, to look at today, to read at today, to focus upon. Uh, we thank you that indeed you have sent the Messiah for our salvation, who is the Son of God, who is very God and very man, who lived the perfect righteous life that we could not live, who died on the cross to take the wrath that we deserve so that all who look to him might have eternal life. We thank you, God, that you bring about true repentance and hatred of sin. We thank you that you give us true salvation, God, and we pray that even now, uh, if there's anyone at the sound of my voice listening today or here present that has not been saved, we pray that, Lord, you would move upon them and bring them to salvation today. Help us who are believers to be strengthened by this focus on your word today. It's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, obviously there's a, there's a transition that is happening now. You might call it a transition in redemptive history or a transition that is happening in the story of salvation. Uh, that is quite significant. Look over at verse 22. Uh, we see this, this radical change now going from John the Baptist. Uh, that's where all the attention of Israel was at during his ministry. To now it's shifting, it's moving, it's transitioning to look at Jesus. Verse 22 and through 24. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. And he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem. Uh, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. Now, here is the transition. Uh, the only one who had, had been mentioned doing any baptizing at this time is John the Baptist. But lo and behold, we get to this, this passage here, and it says Jesus, right, uh, it, it is, was doing some baptizing. Now, this is cleared up a little bit. If you look over at John chapter 4, verse 1 through 2, we see that it's not actually Jesus who was doing the baptizing, it appears, but it looks like it was vicariously being done 
or that, that by his disciples that he was ba- Jesus was baptizing by means of his disciples. Look at John 4, 1 through 2. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and then he clarifies, right? Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. So letting Scripture interpret, interpret Scripture, we would probably move this over to that 3, uh, 22 as well, that Jesus is actually not the one baptizing, but it is being done in his name, is being done by his disciples. He is not the one baptizing. Most likely, that is the case. It does look like letting 4, 2 explain uh, the, the passage here in, uh, in John 3. And, uh, you know, we don't, the, the exact reasoning, why, it, I mean, it could be to avoid pride. It could be to avoid ego. We know that, that later on Christians were dealing with that. I follow Paul and I follow Apollos. And just imagine if one of them had actually been baptized by Jesus Christ himself, right? Well, you were baptized by Paul. Psh, I was baptized by the Son of God in the flesh, you know. So it most likely it was something to that where Jesus is letting uh, the disciples do this. Uh, now, also in this passage, worth noting, I think, there in verse 23, uh, John was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plentiful water there. I think this is another point that can be added to uh, the, the Baptist quiver, if you might say, as far as baptism by immersion goes. Uh, if they were looking for places to sprinkle, any old coffee cup or, or a bowl of water would have worked right, but they're looking to much water, and that's where we see baptisms being performed. It's near the Jordan or this place called Anon, uh, history, uh, historical documents seem to think they've located where that is at and are near there. And there's, there's seven bountiful springs that were, that were coming out of the ground there. There was lots of water there. So water was plentiful there. And uh, we see that that would, that would make the most sense if you're going to be doing baptism to go where water is plentiful. Uh, we know when Jesus was baptized, right, they come out of the water. Or when, when Peter is baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, they both go into the water. And it, there is this, this immersion, this submersion there that represents the, the full cleansing, the full washing. Also uh, signifies the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the new life that we have in Christ Jesus now. So even if it's not that strong, big of a point just by itself, I still think there is something there uh, that they're going to where water is plentiful. Uh, they were not using a cistern like uh, the waters that were turned into wine back there in uh, John chapter 2. They went where there was lots of water. Now, uh, is baptism important? Just to look at baptism for a moment. Uh, yes, it is definitely important. As we've looked at the baptism that John was bringing, uh, it was to express guiltiness of sin. He was preaching, he was telling them, confess your sin, see yourself as filthy, see yourself as dirty in the eyes of a holy God, and that you need to be washed. Uh, these, these purification rites were very common. Many of them are in the Old Testament. The Pharisees had added more purification rites also, but yet John is saying, even the Jews need to be baptized, and we covered this early on, if a Gentile wanted to convert to the Jewish religion, they required them to be baptized. But John comes along and calls the Israelites out to be baptized, saying it's not just the Gentiles that are dirty. You, as an Israelite, even though your father is Abraham, you are a dirty, sinful sinner just the same. You need to be cleansed. So John was calling them to admit their guilt, admit that they need to confess, they need to repent, and he was calling them to believe in the Messiah that he was there to announce. Uh, the baptism of Christ that he and the disciples are doing seems to be very similar. Uh, even now, baptism means a lot. It means all of that and even more now because we have the completed gospel now. If you look over at Romans 6, verse 3 through 4, you'll hear something said very common similar to this most of the time when someone is baptized and it's just a reminder of what baptism does represent. Uh, does baptism save the person? No, it does not, but it does represent their salvation. It does symbolize their salvation, you might say, and it is commanded. Uh, but here in Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 4, 
Paul is talking about that unity that we truly have in Christ Jesus that all believers have. But it's also that there is this analogy here to the baptism process. Look at verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So it's very symbolic of the actual salvation that has happened, the unity that we have in Christ through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, is baptism. Uh, so we see that John the Baptist, as the herald, is telling people to be baptized, right? Uh, Jesus is now coming along, and this, this ministry of baptism is moving now to the Messiah, to his disciples, but the same points are out there. Confess, repent, believe, right? So that's what we continually see as we look at baptism. Those who are being baptized are those who have and who are confessing, repenting, and believing. Those are requirements for those who are being baptized. Uh, look at Matthew 28, 19, very common scripture. But uh, we see that after Jesus had been raised from the dead, uh, he commands his disciples to continue to carry this on. It was not just for this time period of, of the herald, uh, John the Baptist, and the Messiah, but this is to continue on. Uh, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here again we see this command that is now expanded Right, It's not just the, the, the salvation of the Jews or the, the stick with the bronze serpent, but now it's to go. Uh, Satan has been bound and the, the gospel goes forth. Go to all nations. What should you do? Teach them. Make the disciples. Just as Jesus made the disciples, he taught them. Now you continue to teach others. They are all to be baptized as well. Not just the Jews, but believers from any nation, every nation. And this is to continue on. And that's why we baptize people still to this day. And uh, just a few applicable questions, but think about this. Have you been saved and subsequently been baptized? And if not, why is that? Uh, why would you not be baptized? We look into the New Testament, we see when people believed, they were baptized. You look at uh, the, the day of Pentecost, so you have 3,000 people who believed and were baptized, right? You look at the Ethiopian eunuch who, who believed and was baptized. You look at uh, Cornelius who believed and was baptized. And this is, the, this, is, this is the command. It's practiced. It's given. This is what we are to do. Why are people not baptized today? Sometimes it has to do with embarrassment. Sometimes it has to do with pride. Even like, ah, oh, I don't want to, to do that. It is unusual, right? Uh, as far as our world is concerned, to do such a thing... But it was unusual then. It wasn't like people were just out getting baptized all up and down the Jordan River until John the Baptist came along, uh, until Jesus commanded it, right? This was, this was unusual then. It's still unusual now, but yet God commands it. And uh, if Jesus would humble himself enough to be baptized, this is one of the questions I often pose to people who have a little trouble with it. Like if Jesus, the creator, God in the flesh, who made everything, would humble himself to be baptized, you think you would able, be able to lower yourself just a little, right, <laughs> for that kind of humility, to identify yourself with Christ, the one who has saved you, died for you, rose from the dead for you? It, it, it definitely should be something that, that you need to walk forward in obedience to. Um, we, and this, is, this was and truly is a, a Christian's public profession of faith. Oftentimes, churches have manipulated this, changed this, I think, to say the altar call is the public profession of faith. But we see nothing like that in the Bible. We do not see an altar call uh, to make your public profession of faith. You know what we see? We see baptism. Baptism is the ultimate public profession of faith. It shows your unity with Christ. It shows you admit that you're a sinner. You're confessing your sin. You're trusting in Christ to forgive you of your sin. And it goes hand in hand with right belief in Jesus Christ. So if that is something you need to discuss, we'll be glad to talk to you about that, salvation or baptism today. And we do have a couple of young men getting baptized uh, later in May. So if you want to join in on that, think through those things. 
Uh, let's look at verse 24 there in John chapter 3. Just a little parenthetical statement here where the Apostle John adds, for John had not yet been put into prison. This is all we really get of this. Uh, in order to get more on that, we have to go to a different gospel. Many of you know the story, but look with me over at Matthew 14, verses 3 through 11. And this, 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 this transitioning of John the Baptist being the baptizer over to Jesus and his disciples being bab doing the baptizing uh, is not so much mentioned in Matthew. It's not really mentioned in Mark. Uh, but it is mentioned here in John. Um, and then John take, uh, expands some points and takes some information uh, that, that he doesn't add into. And this is, that's why we go to Matthew for this to see more about what's he talking about here. Uh, why is John in prison? Uh, John was in prison because he was calling out sinners. And it was not just the common people that he was calling out sin upon. He was calling out those who were very powerful. That's what we see happening here. Look at verse 3, Matthew chapter 14. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guest, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother." All right, this is one weird section, right? This is a lot of horrible stuff going on. Um, Herod has basically stolen the wife of his brother. He is living in adultery, and John the Baptist is calling him out to repent, to confess. It's not just, again, not just the, the laity, the common folks of, that he's calling. He's going to the top. He's unashamed. Uh, he's not scared of what's going to happen. He calls out Herod himself. Uh, Herod wants to put him to death, but notice that Herod is, is an extreme sissy. Uh, who is he scared of here? He's scared of the people, but who is he more scared of as the story continues on? His wife. <laughs> He's more scared of his wife than the people, and so he decides to, to give her what she wants. And the, the, in here you have a wicked daughter, you have a wicked mother, you have a wicked uh, husband who's living in adultery. It's just wickedness, 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 and uh, just just and a poor excuse of a man who just caves. He doesn't want to offend the people, even though he wants to kill John. And, and now his wife has said this and wants, wants John dead, and his wife is going to manipulate the daughter. And sure enough, uh, what a birthday present, uh, a head on a platter. It's what, and, and so their goal was to shut the mouth of this person up. How can we stop him from calling uh, us sinners? I know, let's chop it off, right? That's going to cure it in the end. Uh, that's what their, their hope is. And so they kill John the Baptist. Uh, so what, we, what do we see from this? John's life, his boldness, and the death uh, serve as a reminder that suffering in this life is often part of life, even for the most faithful of believers. And we see that John wrestled a little bit with this. Once he got into prison, right? He was in prison and sent back note to Jesus. Like, you know, are you the one, right? Because I kind of thought we were going to rule and reign and have lots of, like, thought it might be a little different. Now I'm in prison and uh, now his head's getting chopped off. It's like, it's like is, this, is this what it looks like to serve the king on earth? And uh, Jesus basically says, Yes, you're right. He says, I, I am that person. Trust in me, and whatever is happening to you, it is in the sovereign plan of God, even to suffer for his name. So we see that John continued to, to obey. He continued to speak truth. Even when he was put in prison, he kept on speaking the truth. Lots of boldness there with John. Uh, look at verse 25 of John chapter 3. Let's turn back over there. John chapter 3, verse 25. 
26 as well. All right, so we got John, who is not imprisoned yet. He is baptizing. At the same time, Jesus is baptizing. Now, this is interesting because you got two of the, 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 the primary ones to be announced. You, you, uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the herald and the Messiah are both baptizing in this short window at the same time. So look at verse 25. And they're, they're separated, it looks like, by about six to seven miles, but they are doing the same thing. Uh, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. All right, so first off, why would a Jew be discussing purification with John's disciples? But we did note earlier when we were looking at John that the Pharisees had sent out their underlings to ask, right? Like, by whose authority are you doing such a thing? By whose authority are you baptizing? Because uh, everything religious evolved and centered around the temple and those in charge of the temple, the Sanhedrin was in charge of the temple, uh, the Council of Seventy, the high priest, the chief high priest made the, the, the last one, which brought that number to 71, and they ruled, and they made the rules, they made the regulations, and now they had John the Baptist out here, who was away, far away from the temple, baptizing people and saying that he's a prophet from God, and they are to confess, they are to repent, and this is purification now. So it was quite common to have Jews ask questions like that. Like, by whose authority are you doing such a thing? You don't even, you're not a Pharisee. You're not a Sadducee. You're not a teacher of Israel. You're not in the Sanhedrin. You're not even connected to the temple. That's where all things God are happening. And you're over here doing your own thing. So it was quite common, most likely, for them to ask about purification. What is this purification you're talking about? But also... Something comes up in the conversation, and we don't, we're not, we're not give, made privy to what that is, but it, most likely something came up that they're talking about this purification, what is required for to be baptized, confess, repent, believe in the one to come, and then something must, most likely comes up about, by the way, right, the Messiah has come. And, and maybe there's a mention of that or a thought of that at least by John's disciples were like, yeah, the Messiah has come, and people are going to him, and they need to be taught a little about this. Uh, why is this happening, and what are we supposed to be doing right now? And we're, we're purifying, we're confess, repent, be baptized, uh, believe in the one to come, but yet the one to come is here now. So, uh, and this is a big movement, because at one time, everyone, I'll just read this for you, Matthew 3, verse 5 through 6, says, uh, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to John, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So this was not that long ago. This is a short ministry that John has, and everyone, Jerusalem, it's not literal, but it means lots, Judea and all the region are going out to him. Now, John's disciples uh, are a little bit confused. Like, at one time we had all of this, and yet now all are going to Jesus. What are we supposed to do? And you, you see this confusion with the disciples of Jesus as well. The disciples of Jesus wanted this here, now, prosperity-based uh, uh, with life with Christ on this earth, and Jesus keeps moving that. That's heaven, this is earth, right? Right? I have suffered, you are going to suffer. It looks a lot different than you think. Uh, John's disciples seem to also have some of that as well. They're like, wait a minute, we're with the herald. We are with the prophet, and yet look at our crowds. They are diminishing now. What are we supposed to do with this? So John, John the Baptist, takes them to school. They are his disciples, and he is about to disciple them. He is about to teach them. So how does John answer them when they come to him and say, look, all are going to him now, the one that you bore witness to? Uh, it seems like there is some envy. It seems like there is some covetousness there. Like, we used to have the big crowds. Now the crowds are over there with the guy you bore witness to. We had a good thing going until you messed it up, John, right? You announced him, and now they're going to him. 
Uh, what does John say? Look at verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So John the Baptist acknowledges the, the sovereignty of God, the full sovereignty of God here. Uh, hey, we cannot receive one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. God blessed John the Baptist with this ministry. All these people were coming. God is now moving that. The attention has moved over here to Jesus. All this is from God. And uh, John, again, just acknowledging the power of God. All things. Uh, you can't receive one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. And John will s struggle a little bit, right? You might say with this once he's in prison. It's like the, he at least has questions. It is one thing to acknowledge the sovereignty of God on a beautiful, sunny, shiny day where the birds are singing and, and the grass is green, the trees are green, flowers are blooming, everything is right with every relationship in your life, and you just sit back and go, God is so sovereign, right? And then, uh, then you're in prison about to get their head cut off, and you're like, God is sovereign. <laughs> it, it's, there is a different challenge there. But, but, so he acknowledges that God is sovereign here, and, and I still believe he affirms that later on, but we do see a struggle there. But uh, here he acknowledges nothing can come from God. Uh, nothing, uh, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Look at verse 28. He continues on. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. This is extremely important. Uh, John the Baptist is reminding them, if you are looking to me as the end game, that you've looked wrongly. I told you up front, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. The Old Testament prophets spoke about the coming anointed one who would bring salvation, who would be the prophet, the priest, the king, who would be the judge, who would be all these things, right? And John the Baptist says, I told you, I'm not that. So don't put that upon me. You're supposed to look to the one who is now here that I announced. It's, it's not me. I am the one to announce him. I am the uh, herald, you might say, to, to let everyone know about him. Now, what does this mean for John the Baptist and his disciples since they're baptizing? But yet the Messiah has come. Look at verse 29 through 30 here. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Wow. Now, the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, had already written about this over in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Uh, we looked at that wedding that happened, right? And how Jesus, uh, John the Apostle, uh, paints Jesus as the ultimate bridegroom when they run out of wine. That was something the bridegroom's family, the bridegroom was in charge of, that Jesus provides fully and sufficiently and turns the water into wine and he is the ultimate bridegroom that's alluded to there. But here John the Baptist straight up declares that Jesus is the bridegroom. Now this is highly, highly significant because in the Old Testament this was a common way of, to speak about God and the people of God. That God was the bridegroom. And the, the Bible used the word bridegroom. We just use the word groom now, but same meaning. But that God is the bridegroom and that his people are the, the, the spy, spouse, the bride, okay? Uh, so now John the Baptist is saying Jesus is the bridegroom. This is huge because that is another reference to God and that Jesus, the one that he bore witness to, is actually God. He is the bridegroom. Now, this is also difficult because wedding ceremonies then and where wedding ceremonies now apparently differed quite a bit. Um, where, uh, as if we mentioned this earlier back in chapter 2, most common now, uh, the bride gets most of the, the focus, the attention, uh, this, the music is played and the, the bride comes in and the, and the dress and all attention is on her. It seems to be a little bit reversed in the history of Israel where actually the groom is kind of the centerpiece and, uh, and, 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 and the bridegroom is there and, and the bride and the, the best man would bring the spouse, uh, the bride, to the bridegroom. And so the point of this is, is that he, John the Baptist is saying, look, I am not the bridegroom. I am not the one getting married. I am just 
the best man. I am just the friend who brings the bride to the bridegroom. This is his day. In other words, I'm not trying to get attention. I'm not trying to get everyone to look at me. I'm trying to get people to look and focus at the one getting married. I'm looking at, give your attention to the bridegroom. I am bringing the, the bride to the bridegroom. How is he doing such a thing? He's telling them to confess, to repent, to believe. This is how he is preparing the bride for the bridegroom. So he's letting them know, I am not trying to get all this attention for me. I am putting this attention on the bridegroom. And look what he says at the end of that, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is his role. This is his responsibility. He's discipling his disciples at this point, saying, look, this is not just my role, but if you are connected with me, this is your role as well. And truly, I mean, to apply this passage, this is what it looks like, uh, success looks like in the ministry of John the Baptist, but all ministries uh, as well. Uh, I must, he must increase, but I must decrease. And whether it is the ministry of a pastor, a church, a missionary, or your personal ministry to others, the heart of it should be, he must increase and I must decrease. It's not about me, 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 me. It's about him and getting people to uh, learn the gospel, hear the gospel, bring them to confess, repent, to believe in the Messiah, not who has come, but who, or who is coming, but who has come now. Uh, look at verse 31, Hebrew, um, John 3. I almost said Hebrews. I've been stuck there so long. John 3, 31. He continues. He says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. And in this little section, John the Baptist is discipling the, this, his disciples on who he is and who Jesus is. And he's comparing and contrasting them as he goes through this. Look, he is the bridegroom. I'm the best man. Do you understand? This is not his, my day. It's his day. I'm, I'm pointing attention to him. And now he's doing this comparison. Look, uh, he who is from above is above all. And this is who Jesus is. He is God. He is above all. He has all power. He is sovereign. He deserves the, every, all respect, all worship, all attention should be going to him. And he does this comparison. Uh, he who is of the earth belongs to the earth. He's talking about himself. Even though John the Baptist was miraculously born, he is not God in the flesh. He is very human. So he's acknowledging that. Look, you want me to be greater than the one who came from heaven? Like, I am from this earth. I speak as one from earth. The one who has come is God. He is above all. He is above everything. Look at verse 32. He bears witness to what he has seen. Still talking about the, the one that he bore witness to, uh, Jesus. Uh, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. So John's acknowledging, even at this point, the one that came from heaven, uh, speaks the word of truth from God, what he has seen, what he has heard, literally, and yet people are not receiving his testimony. And we see, we see this also in John 1. Turn over there to John 1. The Apostle John makes the statement that's extremely similar. John 1, 9 through 12. Where the vast majority of the Jews reject the message of Jesus. They hate the message, reject the message. The Sanhedrin rejects the message. The vast multitude of the Jews hate the message as well. They're not believing him. Even though he, all Jesus is doing is bearing witness to what he has seen and heard uh, in the heavenlies, he, he, he is the word of God. Look at verse 9. Uh, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So again, I think this is the point John is making as he's talking to his disciples. Uh, this, is the, this is God. He is above all things, but yet he's also acknowledging 
people are not listening to him. No one receives his testimony. And there are some who will, right? But it is definitely a minority that will actually believe in him for salvation. The disciples are Jews, but the vast majority of Jews reject him fully. Look at verse 33, John chapter 3. John continues on. He says, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. So how important is it to believe in the message of Jesus? It is extremely important. John is basically putting all this together, saying, look, God, truth, Jesus are all connected and must be accepted together. This is the truth. Those who believe in Jesus, believe in God, and believe the truth. Those who do not believe Jesus, do not believe God, and believe a lie. In fact, John goes on in 1 John 5, 1 to call them straight up liars. If you do not believe in who Jesus says he is, uh, you are saying that, that Jesus is a liar, but that God is a liar as well. And the same is true today. This is really common. Uh, many people claim to believe God, yet do not believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be or his message. That person is calling God a liar. Uh, you cannot just say, oh, I love God, but that, I, don't, I don't think Jesus is who he claimed to be. No, that's, you've got the wrong God. You've created an idol in your head, if that's the case. You're actually calling the real God a liar because God has sent his son and he has revealed ultimate truth in him. This is his object of salvation. He is the one on the cross. All who look to him and believe will have eternal life. Those who do not, they are condemned. They're living in condemnation. They will receive the wrath of God for their sins. So how important is it to believe God? It's vital. And who sets the standard of truth? Us and our opinions and a little gray matter on top of our shoulders? Or God, right? You know, it's, it's God. Look at verse 34. It says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The greatest revealer of God is God. And that's who Jesus is. You go back to John 1.1. 1, 1, it's in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But now he's put on flesh. John 1.14 and dwelt among us, among us. This is God. So again, John is teaching his disciples, look, don't be jealous. Uh, we're doing what we're supposed to do over here. And we're pointing to the bridegroom. We're getting the bride to the groom by announcing, confess, repent, believe, right? And, and he's far superior. He's from above. I am from earth. I am a prophet. I do speak uh, for God, represent God to the people, but yet he is the word, every word. Look at verse 34 again. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. And he's been given the spirit without measure. Uh, look over at Luke 1. Verses 13 through 17. Luke 1, verses 13 through 17. We acknowledge that obviously John the Baptist had a very special role. Uh, he was the, the prophesied herald. Uh, you look at uh, Isaiah is announcing this one who is going to the voice in the desert crying out and he's preparing a way for the Lord. Uh, you look at the very last prophecy of the Old Testament before the white pages before the New Testament, and it's about God sending this prophet who is going to announce the Messiah. This is tremendous. And then you, you go back to um, Zechariah as Gabriel announces to him that your son is going to be the messenger, the herald, to announce the Messiah that is to come. That's what breaks the New Testament, opens it up. Uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, what's, what's, the, what's the difference there? You have the herald who has been a prophesied, then you have the prophecy fulfilled. I mean, that is the New Testament. Then it begins, right? It's huge. John's role is tremendous. Uh, and he has the Holy Spirit in a special way, uh, but Jesus has it in a different way. Look at verse 13. We'll see this difference, or some of it. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, 
He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You might underline that or think about that for a moment. Even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the, heart, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the people a Lord of people prepared. So here you have this great message from Gabriel, the announcement. Your son, Zechariah, is the great messenger, the one that will be an Elijah-type figure that's going to, going to prepare the way for the Lord. But that's unusual in verse 15, he'll be filled with the Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, as far as I know, there's no one else whom this is said about in the Bible. It sets John the Baptist apart as an extremely unique prophet of God. But as great as that is, it's different than the one over here, baptizing down their way six or seven miles. This one, according to verse 34, uh, in John, John chapter 3, he gives the Spirit without measure. It's not that Jesus is just anointed with the Spirit or filled with the Spirit, but he gives gives the Spirit without measure. And he has been given the Spirit by God the Father without measure. As great as John the Baptist is, John the Baptist is not a member of the Trinity, right? So again, it's just comparing and contrasting here. Yes, the Holy Spirit has used us. He's talking to his disciples. He has used me in a great way to, to, to profit, pro, to speak the words of prophecy, confess, repent, believe, right? And God has moved in, in me to do such a thing and in the people to do such a thing. But the one who is even greater is here, God in the flesh, who has been given the Spirit without measure and who gives the Spirit also uh, without measure. We see that's a big difference in he and John the Baptist. John baptizes with water, but what does John bab uh, Jesus baptize with? The Holy Spirit. Right? It's, it's greater. Uh, look at verse 35. Uh, he goes on to say, The Father loves the Son, has given all things into his hand. Again, just showing that Jesus is far greater than me. I'm John the Baptist. All things are not given into my hands. I'm still eating locusts. All right? All things have been given to him. All things. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. This is Jesus. Verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is really going back to something that's continually repeated throughout the book of John, very similar to what we opened up with at John 3, verse 14, 15, and 16, uh, looking to the, to the bronze serpent and live. If you don't, you die. Uh, looking now to the uh, God so loved the world that gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life, right? It's very similar. Um, and the question, is, if you look at this, if you have people wondering, or if you're wondering, do you have eternal life? How can you know if you have eternal life? You look back at these verses. Uh, do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for your salvation? This is what you must think. Do you, is this the Jesus you believe in for your salvation? Do you believe in the Son? Uh, if not, and you're living in disobedience to the Son, in opposition to the truth of God, calling God a liar, and not saved from the wrath of God, and will not have eternal life. All this is tied in, this John chapter 3, thinking on these things, going back to Nicodemus, entering into the kingdom of God, right? And now he's moving on to John, but the same point is being made. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Believe in him for eternal life. There's nowhere else to look. If you had been bitten by a snake, the poison was coursing through your veins, and God says, look at this bronze serpent, and you said, no, I'm going to look at that tree. You're going to die, right? And so it is with Jesus Christ. God has given his son to die on the cross that whoever looks at him shall be saved. If you're looking anywhere else, you're going to die, but not just physical death, eternal death. You are condemned by God. Look at verse 36. The wrath of God remains on that person. It doesn't go away. Herod, Herodias, and, and uh, the daughter 
all thought they had gotten rid of the voice of God that was annoying them to tell, calling them a sinner, right? No, John died that day, but even in the book of Revelation, lets us know that they, where is he at now? He's at the throne of God. Doesn't say his name specifically, but even the Christians who are beheaded are at the throne of God in the book of Revelation. Instantaneously, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, Herod, Herodias, and his daughter thought they could shut the voice of God up by killing the prophet of God. No. They died as well, and they died with the guilt of every sin they had committed, and they remained in the wrath of God. Where are they now? They're still receiving the wrath of God. Where will they be 100 years from now, 2,000 years from now? They will always be remaining in the wrath of God for all of eternity. They rejected the voice of God. They did not look to the Messiah. They did not confess. They did not repent. They did not believe. Powerful verse here in verse 36. Um, in summary, John the Baptist teaches his disciples what it means to serve God. And it is not to gain attention for the glory of oneself. It is the opposite of selfishness. It is to point people to the one who is greater. He was getting people's attention to point them to the bridegroom. As we saw, John did not do this in a seeker-friendly kind of a way. He was clear about sin, salvation, the person of Jesus, and the consequences of not believing in him for salvation. Uh, may John's humility, boldness, and clarity of message be an example for you as well today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity of John the Baptist's message to confess, to repent, to turn from sin, and to believe in the Messiah for salvation. God, help us as we look at people like this in the Bible, like John, who was unashamed uh, to stand for you, to, whether it was to the multitudes or to those who were in charge, even in high government positions, he continued to call people to confess and to repent. He did not soften his message. It was not a seeker-friendly message, but it was dealing rightly with sin and proclaiming clearly who they were to believe in for salvation. God, help us to be more like that. Help us to be bold, help us to be clear, and help us to present the beauty of the gospel and the horribleness of sin and where that sin leads. Help us to, to let people know uh, God has given Jesus Christ. All who believe in him will be saved. Those who do not remain in the wrath of God and will receive that fully uh, one day. Lord, help us to be clear with that message. We thank you that you have sent Jesus to us. And as we look at these passages today, God, I pray that they would comfort believers who are here. And may they bring discomfort to unbelievers until they are comforted with this message. That those who believe in Jesus Christ and look to him for salvation can rest in knowing the poison is gone. They have been rescued. They've been given eternal life. They are not condemned. They're not under the wrath, but they have received grace. And we thank you for that beautiful grace that's been given to us. In Jesus